All right, you two, we are here in the Wilkin residence, um, mixing it up here from this episode. So bring you a lot of training content. Obviously that's kind of been, you know, our, our go-to, what we've been able to like really excel in this channel with is showing you, you know, how we train as well as giving you ideas, techniques, um, just a little philosophy behind training and understanding why you're training. But also we've always keep, we continue to talk about all the importances of everything else in be, you know, behind the scenes of bodybuilding. Um, so we wanted to do another Q and A session today. First one was really fun. Got like you know a lot of good, good questions. Wanted to give a little bit of time to build that back up, um, and then we got some more questions. Pretty damn damn good questions here today as well. So this will give a you a chance to kind of you know give our opinions on other things and just, besides just exercises, training you know um, in our daily in our daily routines there, but also go more in depth on what you specifically want to see. Um, so how we're going to do this is I'm going to. Um, I'm going to ask him some questions that he got and he's also going to go back and forth and ask me questions that, that I got as well. Um, so go ahead Martin, you pick one here and then um, for me and I'll answer first and then we'll keep rolling here, okay? Alright guys, so the first question that Brett got here was, it says, I'm planning a hardcore gym startup. Suggestion on having gym equipment. What do you find is best for quads and lats? So what do you think, Bob? Um, so starting the gym, you know, like we've talked about this, you know, it'd be something that we want to do someday. Um, and we'd be like kids in the candy store doing it too. So the first thing you need to do is get an understanding of equipment and that's just going to be through trial and error over time. You know, we, we have been doing this for a while now, you know, that we've gone to many different gyms. We've used different pieces of equipment. I remember when training where you just kind of showed up if something looked familiar, you kind of did it. Now we're at a point where we know every single name of every piece of equipment. We can we can go back and reflect, talk about, hey, remember that Atlantis, remember that Cybex, remember that, you know, that free motion, everything. So we know all the names of it now, and it makes it a lot more fun because you can kind of, when you get to that point of building a gym, you can make it very customizable and get the things that you know that work, that you like, um, that would be most beneficial for, you know, your 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 employee base, or your, your crowd there, your customers that are going to be there. So... Um, when I'm going to approach, you know, it's like I said, there's so many different options. You kind of just need to try on there, figure out exactly what you like. Um, for quads, I mean, you can't go wrong going specifically into this question. You obviously need to get some hack squats. Um, you can't go wrong with getting, you know, some great hack squats. The, the Cybex one is my favorite. You see us do it all the time. It's because it's the hardest. It's the highest angle. It's going to be the heaviest. It's going to be the be best load on your quads. I recently used the Atlantis um, hack squat. And I really, really like that one too. So I don't think you can go wrong with those two. And then obviously, like you know, the the Icarian and the, um, the Arsenal are very similar um, hack squats in their angle. Um, but it's very solid that everybody can use and get comfortable with. It. It's a great one for the gym. Um, moving on from there, you got to get some good leg extension equipment. Uh, we are very. We use leg. You know, we do leg extensions every quad session. Doesn't need to be heavy. You don't need something like super loaded, but like just something smooth, and then you can feel the contraction not only on like, you know, we talked about not only on the you know the vast medialis, the vast lateralis, um, but also all the way through, all the way through your quads, all the way up to the hips. So something for full range of motion there. Uh, you need leg pressing. You always get leg presses, squat racks. You know, then that's when you can kind of use different bars like the safety squat bar. Um, and then, you know, some kind of single leg press as well. So those are going to be your quad essentials. Um, for lats, I mean, you, you go, I could be here forever on those. There's so much good back equipment there. Um, and not, not only that, but there's so many good attachments now with like the prime, the mag grips, all these different grips. Um, so you, the, the main thing here is just do your homework, ask around, ask bodybuilders that have been doing this a long time. Cause like I will, you know, I love having conversations about equipment when someone asks me, Hey, what's the best one of this? You know, I need this for my gym. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I think, and that's going to be the most efficient. So, like I said, trial and error, ask around, try things out, and go from there. Yeah. Um, to just to add to this, guys, I think uh, main thing here is going to be budget uh, and size of the gym. So, uh, if your gym is huge and you have an unlimited budget, obviously, I could send you a list of twenty pieces of equipment for both of these things. Um, as far as my favorite pieces of equipment that we train on on a regular basis, as Brett said, the Cybex uh, hack is my favorite probably for quads, as well as the Arsenal Pendulum. I think that's a great one, um, and it doesn't take a lot of weight for it to be heavy. So um, that's something to take into consideration also, um, as we were talking about today on buying a leg press for a home gym, 
Um, it's something that you have to think about is how heavy it is it and how much weight you have to buy. Um, so these are all things to take in consideration. Um, for back, my favorite piece of equipment is <clears throat> the uh, Magro that we have at the gym here and it, it just it hits all angles. So again, if you only have limited space, you find a piece of equipment that can attack from multiple different angles. So those are kind of my favorites as far as something that you can utilize um, in multiple different ways. Uh, but building a gym is going to be, it's really going to come down to either you're building it for yourself like Brett and I would um, and we would pick our favorite things or you build it for the community that you're trying to promote and you're really going to have to go to those people and ask them what they want. Um, outside of that, it's pretty straightforward on building a gym. Um, you just what give the people what they want. Oh, yeah. All right, this one will be good. This one's kind of getting into some of our, what's your craziest bulking um, calorie intake and for how long? So like, what, what's what been one of your like, you know, when you're eating the most in the off season and what, kind of, what, what were those numbers at? Yeah, so um, I mean, I've had a couple crazy off seasons. Probably my biggest off season uh, was two years ago. And it was uh, probably because I was working construction. So on top of training as a full-time bodybuilder, um, I was also working eight to 10 hours a day as a construction worker, five to six days a week. So um, I think overall my calories for on paper uh, were around 77, 80 um, of clean food. And then every single night before bed, um, if I got all my meals in, I could have whatever I wanted. And I usually did a cheat meal there. Um, upwards of a thousand calories. So I would say I was eating anywhere from 8,000 to 8,500 every single day. Um, and I did that for about six months. Um, it sucked. Um, I hated food. At that point when I was working construction, I felt like it was a lot easier to eat. This off season, I tried to do something similar and ended up having to do a couple more cheat meals, less clean food. Um, which was harder on my digestion just because I wasn't as active and burning as many calories. Uh, but I put on similar, if not more weight. So, uh, you know, energy expenditure is a big factor in this. Um, and I think Brett's probably has a lot to go into this as well. Cause I know he's hit some big numbers too. Yeah, probably not that, you know, I, I he's a little bit more of an eater sometimes. Um, the thing is we all, the thing is like, we just always have to continue to eat that much. So it's always in a range of something, and it's every day. It's not just like, yeah, I had some crazy 15,000 calorie days in a row. <laughs> yeah, and then I grew. Yeah, that'd be cool, but that's not what we're about. Like, you also got to remember, like, we're focused on keeping our midsections. So it's like, we, yes, we you have to eat so much, but what we've, got, what we've done good at is we're, we're really good at spreading that out. So, you know, throughout six to seven meals, like, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't, and it's hard to say because you you know I, I you always feel full, but we're not eating to the point where our stomach is actually stretched. You know what I mean? So those 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 meals need to be you either need to make them you know be strategic about them like with like the cream of rices, doing like meal replacement shakes, doing things that condense down and are calorically dense um, over just always just stuffing your face and stretching out your stomach. So we still have to do that. Uh, I'm probably. Like I said, when I got up to, the biggest I got in this off season, I was over 280, like going to bed a few times. Um, and that's when I was really trying to push it there at the end because I knew prep was coming up. And you know, that was the same thing. Like I would eat six clean meals and at the end like big bowl of cereal with protein in there. Probably close to a thousand carbs a day, 450 to 500 grams of protein. And then probably like 100 to 120 grams of, of fats. So, you know, still looking at that, you know, almost 7,000 calories, six to 7,000 calories. Um, and that was just because we, you know, we, we had to, you know, to get to the, get that size on that we're cutting down the show off now. Heck yeah. All right. Question number two for Brett. Um, this one is, it says balancing an outstanding body building career and a marriage. Good one. Yeah. So that just comes down to the, you know, that comes down to the balance aspect of, of bodybuilding is, you know, the thing is with me. In my relationship, you know, with Ivana here, is we our relationship started before bodybuilding. So you know, when I met her, I was I was even I didn't even know what bodybuilding was yet. She was already a pro, but that wasn't like a main focus for. Her. So we built our relationship first. Um, you know, got our core values there. 
you know, build everything. And then we kind of, then that's when, you know, we took that path of it, we're going to run with this bodybuilding thing because, you know, we both really enjoy it. You know, we've made it a lifestyle now. Um, so we've grown through that avenue as well. Uh, so, it, and don't get me wrong. I mean, like, it is extremely tough. I think if you follow any, any of the fitness people, like, you see that, you know, there are a lot of breakups. There are a lot of, you know, things that don't work out. There are, there's drama, everything. But it just comes down to the individual and, like, taking care of your shit. Um, you got to be able to, obviously, we talk about how selfish bodybuilding is. But you can still be selfish with bodybuilding and when you need to be. But you also need to be able to communicate with your significant other when those times are going to be. You know, make those, you know, make the balance plans of this is going to be our time, you know, down the road. That's that. This is your time to be selfish. This is my time to be selfish. Um, so the thing is, comes down to communication, you know, understand each other, what your like true goals are, you know, and, and then find that person that's going to live the lifestyle with you. Like if, if, you know, my significant other wasn't interested in bodybuilding, then we probably wouldn't be together. You know what I mean? Like it just wouldn't work out just because of how much time I have to put into this. Um, and you know my love for it and then the, that's where issues arise so you need to find you first comes out of communication you setting it up with your significant other and then obviously both enjoying the process together can I get huge without deadlifts <laughs> there's no lift that specifically can get you huge um, obviously you guys know this we've talked about this plenty of times on the channel um, you see our training sessions and our splits and the exercises we do. I don't even think, have we deadlifted? One Maybe once. Um, but no, no exercise is going to be important for getting you huge. All exercises can make you huge. You can get fucking huge off push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups. So um, I wouldn't worry about single exercise. Just get intense, push yourself as hard as you can, and eat the right foods and sleep and, and rest and grow. So... I just going on that. Um, obviously, like you said, you, there's no one exercise that is the most important. One thing you should also know, so is if you do deadlift and you are a good deadlift and you're doing it right, you usually have a back on you too. So if you if you're just trying to ask us that, like, can I get away without doing it? Yeah, you can. But if you do deadlift and you do it right and you work your way up, progress up, it, it's gonna build it back too. So think about that as well. Um, this is a good one. This could be, you know, for both of us. Talk about how you became about being sponsored by Gasp. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is one thing that I think Brett and I have done a really good job of just overall in our career is making connections with good people um, and showing good people that we're good people. So, um, we got our connection with Gasp through a couple mutual connections with the company. Um, we know Branch from coming up here and coming to Armbrust and having to do with some shows and stuff up here. And Ar Armbrust is involved with Gasp and they did an, uh, a world tour out here. And when they did, they saw Brett and I and saw how hard we work worked. And um, you know, Dylan is somebody that's had our back since the beginning and we've had his back and he was kind of just telling these guys like, hey, just, just keep an eye on these two. They're gonna be the next big things. And uh, because of those things, uh, you know, they noticed our hard work, and because of that, uh, they just keep giving us a helping hand. I think um, it just shows through on if you just keep doing the right things, the right people will notice. Yeah, like you said, man, just stay true to yourself. Don't try to be somebody you're not. Don't try to get on social media and act. If you notice, we've never tried to act like anybody else, you know. You know, we, we keep the shit simple. You know, we love training. We love bodybuilding. We love to work hard, um, and we like to share that. So... Just being ourselves is what brought us the gas, and you know Michael picked up on that. He came out here and visited one time. You know, loved you know meeting us, um, and then the next year invited us down, and we just went down there. What we went down there, trained with you know a couple people, kicked some ass, just beat <laughs> ourselves, you know, and then that's how it came about. So don't try to overdo things. Don't try to pretend to be somebody else. If it's if it didn't mean if it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't meant to be. You know, then that, and then then leave it. You know, leave it as that. So we you know we were just. We're lucky, we're fortunate enough to, you know, we got the opportunity and they liked what they saw and I think, you know, it was the best decision they could have made because moving forward, we're going to be bringing a lot of good stuff for them as well. Hell yeah. All right, so this one says, is there a difference between a back offset and a drop set? So, a back offset and a drop set. A drop set is a type of back offset. So, a back offset is a, a set that you do after your top set. 
So uh, if you watch our videos in the past, you know that we usually do two to three warm ups. Um, we work into like either a top set. We either work right into a top set or we do a preset into a top set, um, and then we'll do a back offset. The, the top set should be, you know, your all out set. We usually like to keep it in the eight to the 12 range. You know, it's 95% max load. We're just grinding out, you know, all out intensity for that top set. After that, you can do a back off set, which we love to do. You've been seeing a lot more of that with our prep right now. Um, there's a lot more back off sets. You know, we might not do as many in the off season just because we're more focused on hypertrophy um, and just pushing those top sets. But with these back off sets, they can be, be in a range of many things. So that's when, you know, you can do some time under tension sets where you're slowing down the eccentric portions. You can do, you know, you can do some alternating. So like if there's some single arm, you can do some alternating. You can do a drop set where you're dropping plates each time. Or if it's on a pin load machine, you're dropping the pin loaded. Sorry, you're, you can do the rest pause. You can do the one and a half. So we've given you, if you, you know, continue to watch our videos. We've given you so many options of a back off set. That's just a categorized, um, that's a category of those many, many, many different variations we've shown you. So that, that I mean, good question to kind of explain on that. Um, but if you've been watching, you should know that by now. <laughs> this is a good one. Can't, this, this guy can't sleep post show, always waking up. Any tips? Um, I mean, this can be a variation of a few different things. Um, likely get your blood work done, check your hormones, um, something's maybe out of whack. The other thing is, is what are you doing food wise? Are you rebounding? Are you reversing? Uh, oftentimes waking up in the middle of the night has to do with blood sugar and either blood sugar drops or blood sugar being very high um, or indigestion. So these are all some things you just need to take in consideration. Go through these factors and check boxes and kind of find what is your why on what is affecting your sleep. Good. Another thing is, man, just give some time. Like, you, what it is, is you, you just, the reason you're probably not sleeping well is because you just went through a prep. You're probably on a lot of, you know, cutters, a lot of uppers, you know, things that, you know, keep you up at night and your body, you're starving it. So the reason you aren't sleeping, the reason people don't sleep during prep is because their body is going into a fight or flight response and it's waking you up even though you know you can't eat mentally in your brain, your body doesn't know you can eat. So it's trying to wake you up to go find food. So what happens is, when after a show you start, I know you're putting food back in, but it takes a little time to your body to respond and realize, hey, I'm not starving it anymore. Um, so for me, it does take you know probably about another month after a show before I start sleeping in a little bit more. Um, but it will go back to normal. But like I said, if you want to speed up the process, you can definitely you know do what he was talking about. So um, I got one here. This one's great for Marty. So solution for a weak chest. So pretty much our whole offseason. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously, guys, go watch any of our push sessions. Uh, I do a lot of talking about exercise selection and the things that have worked best for us, uh, the things that have brought my chest up. But in simplest terms, in easiest way to think about things is the muscle that's in front is going to be doing the work. Um, oftentimes, guys, your delt is what's taking over and not letting your chest do the work. And it's because you're slouching your chest and letting your delt be in front of the pec. Um, really work on shoulder rotation, down and back, retracting those shoulder blades and making sure that the pec is in front of the delt. Um, and in doing so, the chest will do the work. And because of that, your chest will grow. Um, but I think in, in long term solution for exercise selection, stuff like that, go check out these other videos we have on push. Um, you'll find lots and lots of beneficial things there. All right, uh, next question for Brad. This is a good one. Um, it says, do you lower carbs on rest day or do you keep food the same? So I do choose to, I, I, I personally choose the lower carbs on rest days. Um, this is in the off season and on prep a little bit, not as much kind of like on prep. It's just, it's more strategic on prep. But the reason we do, I know he does too in the off season is like on those rest days in the off season, you kind of need, we kind of want to give our digestion a little bit of break. So this goes back into always like, you know, we have to eat so much food that like we don't want it to back up too much. So our rest days, we actually lower the protein a little bit, but we, I definitely lower the carbs quite a bit. Um, I'm not talking like half, maybe like one fourth. But just that little bit of break, you know, then like you can go to that next day knowing that you got to eat another 6,000 calories and be more comfortable. On prep, I definitely do as well. 
um, just because you're not you're not using those carbs. So you know, especially as we get closer to show, our whole purpose is gonna you know we're trying to be as shredded as possible while keeping as much muscle as possible. So on those days that we're not actually training the muscle, we don't need as much energy. Um, so I decide you know I take out my intra carbs during that. Obviously, I don't do the big intra drink, um, and I'll even take my usually my post workout carbs. Um, so I won't do my cream or rice there in the post workout, and I'll just lower it probably by 30% overall. This is seem, I think this is a good trick for you to try. It seems to be effective. Um, if you're gonna, you know, that's one thing we never have to worry about is pushing conditioning. It's because we're always we're always conscious of it, and we're doing these things on the you know, our off days and stuff. Yeah. So I mean, like Brett said, this. I mean, I run things very similar to him. I think our diets are pretty similar, other than he uses a little bit more fat than me. Um, but like he said, in the off season, for me, uh, it's really a digestive thing. I actually usually go back to four meals on off season rest days um, and lower my protein back just because we're not training. And then also because we're not training, I don't have that pre workout protein shake in the off season. Usually I do a pre protein shake and a post protein shake. So both of those are gone, which is eliminating some food and some calories and some carbohydrates, as well as the intro, which is generally 100, 150 carbs there. So food gets pulled back a lot on rest day. And I think one, again, like Brett talked about earlier with food consumption is this is a good way to keep your waist intact, uh, keep digestion intact. And, um, you know, if you have issues with this or you have issues with constantly bloating, this is something that I think you can utilize. Um, as Brett said too, in prep, this is something that I think these are the days that you can push without losing performance in the gym. So as you've seen day after day, Brett and I are trying to hit PRs even when we're a week or two weeks out from a show. Um, and because of that, food has to be high on those days that we're training, especially around our training session. So the way that we can do this and push and make sure that we're peeled is to take those rest days and make them even harder, even though they suck already. So um, it's something that we both utilize. And then um, I do it a little bit different than Brett as he kind of just pulls a little bit of food and kind of keeps his meals the same. Um, I actually pull most of my carbs from the whole day do protein veg leading up, and then uh, depending on where I'm at conditioning wise, meal six might be a cheat meal, um, or it will just be a little bit of carbs before bed to help with sleep. So that's just the, how I run things. Uh, but yes, rest day, pulling food back, I think is a very beneficial decision. I'm gonna combine a few questions here because they're kind of the same. Um, people are really interested in who can eat more here. So who can put down more food, you or Brett, and then Ten thousand dollars for who can eat the most five guys burgers. Who wins, you or Brett? So, well, like I mentioned that a little bit. I think I think Marty's probably gonna win. It, it matters what state we're in, because right now I'd give him a run for my money, because just because I'm closer to the show and I, I feel like I could eat a lot of burgers right now because it's been a while. But on a normal basis, if we were just, you know, normally eating, and we went to a went to the burger joint, he'd probably eat more than me. So that's your answer with him. He has the he has the big big appetite. I'm just. I just try to get everything in throughout the day. Um, and then Marty here, if you could only wear one brand of clothing for the gym, what would that brand be? And then also, do you have certain clothing for certain body parts, which we've kind of shown? Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah, so, um, I mean, to tap into the food thing, um, honestly, guys, it comes down to probably me just being younger. Um, that's the only reason I think I could probably eat more than Brett, but realistically, um, we both can eat a shitload of food and I think it comes down to probably the three days leading into it who ate more food on those days on who has the better digestion and things yeah. roll in the right way so um, but yeah no so then going into the clothing thing um, I mean you guys already know my team is gasped that would be my clothing company um, not because of the clothes themselves and the look necessarily, but because if I'm going to only wear one clothing company and that's going to represent me, um, I want to be represented by something that's hardcore. I want to be represented by hard work and dedication and uh, no, no excuses and no compromise, which that's what GASP is. So um, that would be my company. Uh, going a little bit into, like he said, the clothing selection on body part days. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually very picky on that. So leg days, uh, we wear our serial killer shirts. It's kind of our thing. 
Um, leg days is pretty much the only day that I continue to wear a t-shirt through the whole session. So something that is weird about me is I get overheated really easy and when in doing so it kind of makes me feel like shit. So um, you guys see me, I'm in a tank top most of the time. Um, depending on what we're training, uh, the bottoms change from shorts to, to pants. It uh, doesn't really matter that much though. Um, and as you guys, like I said, as you see, um, kind of body part selection kind of depends on if there's an importance for the t-shirt or not. But, um, you know, Gasp is my company and those are the clothes we wear. You guys can see the, the clothing selection throughout the training if you want to. All right. Okay, so uh, again, it, it kind of goes into what we've done. Uh, I'm going to add a couple of these questions together, but um, it's kind of just what are the things that you, how to deal and get through a good off season. So one is what do you do to keep appetite up in the off season? The other thing is how do you combat back, low back pumps? Okay, so how we deal with appetite. Um, that's going to be just gradually increasing your food. So I'm actually going to add this question to it too because this is kind of why is the reverse diet off your show so beneficial for muscle growth if this is even true? So the reverse diet is true and it is a thing and it is something you do. You can call it whatever the fuck you want to call it. Like, you know, like the reverse diet, it was just, hey, this is smart to do after a show because you just, you just depleted yourself for three months. Why would you just go back up to the same amount of food you were eating before you even started prep? So it makes sense, it makes common sense to slowly increase your food out of a show. Um, my rule of thumb, what we do, what we have clients do, is you know enjoy the night of the show and maybe the next day for breakfast or dinner, but then that following Monday, we go right back onto a, a diet. Um, the purpose of this especially is just because of water. You know, the, you're in a, your body's in a tough situation there because you just, you just cut all the water and then you put a bunch of food into it and then, and then that whole weekend you ate up um, and then what can happen is you can be very, very overly watery from that. If you continue to just keep on eating, we've seen people put on 20 to 30 pounds in a matter of days. And you don't want to do that because a lot of health markers can get very, very stressed from that. Um, I know he had a scare that one time when he, was, he said on the show, I've never gotten that bad. But we've gotten to the point where you're uncomfortable, you're sweating, your heart rate's up, your blood pressure's through the roof, and that's not good for you. So. What, the reason we know this reverse diet is so important is it sets up your off season as well. So what you do is you kind of come gradually out of that show and you start slowly increasing food back up. Maybe like, you know, 200 grams of carbs a week. You know, I'm just giving the numbers out there, but that's a good thing to go off two to 400 a week. Um, and then based off where your fats are, maybe increase those as well. But your protein should already be high from before. But it's just you need to set a strategy that your body, because your body is going to be so sensitive to soaking up food at this point after a show, it's your greatest opportunity to grow. I saw my most gains came from a post-show rebound, you know, first, second, third show, him as well. We've seen it with a lot of people. And it's about you being just as dedicated in that post-show, doing that reverse diet as you did the prep, that you're going to see the, you're going to see the most progress. So the reason for that is you want to keep your body sensitive. It's called insulin sensitivity. You want to be, you know, when you eat those carbs, you want to absorb them and you want to use them. You don't want to just blow up right after the show and then you have to kind of go almost go back into another little diet just to kind of get all that off. So be strategic about that. Um, that's a way to keep your appetite high. Is that gradual increase? There are going to be points, you know, way down the further in the off season where that's where we get into. We talked about before going into finding tricks and trades of doing meal replacement shakes if you need to, picking the right foods that work with you, um, maybe supplement MK677, which people have done. Um, there's just, you gotta find tricks and trades to get over those food plateaus, and you just can't be a bitch, too. You gotta you just get your food in. Like, a lot of people don't realize that. It's like, oh, I can't eat, I can't eat. You know how many times I've heard that? You know, and then I, we, we still get it done. You know, we, we, we see people get it done. You just gotta get it done sometimes, you know?